you know, one of our, our observations thinking about how teachers learn is that when teachers learn, they listen to people talk about teaching and they talk with each other about teaching, but they very rarely do teaching. Um, teachers, actually in comparison in particular to other helping professions like nursing, like the clergy, um, teachers have fewer opportunities to practice um, than folks in other professions. When people in social work learn their profession, they sort of practice therapizing each other all the time. Um, and teachers don't have the same kinds of rehearsal opportunities. So we create learning environments inspired by games and simulations that let teachers rehearse for and reflect on important decisions in teaching. Um, one of the things that's most important to us is as we're building these learning environments, um, we don't want to trust that um, people are having powerful learning experiences just because we think what we build are neat. And even if people say that they like what we're doing, um, that's important, um, but that's a pretty preliminary piece of data. A, a key responsibility we have is to keep trying to think about ever more sophisticated ways of measuring the learning experiences we provide to educators and making sure it's not just having them have a good time or having them have valuable learning experience or even just changing their mindset. We really wanna ask this question, like are the learning experiences we're providing changing people's practices? When people have more opportunities for rehearsal and reflection, does it make them better teachers in their classroom? And that's why I'm so grateful to Elizabeth and Josh for leading this work, which both created really powerful learning experiences, which I know um, um, Elizabeth, hopefully as she gets all connected, will be able to share, um, but also being able to measure, you know, whether or not those learning experiences are really helping teachers in the ways that we expect. Um, so with that as a starting point, I'll, I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Um. Great. Uh, thanks, Justin, for the introduction. Um, Elizabeth, you want to talk a little bit about um, your work in designing these simulations? Sure. Hi, everybody. It's great to see everyone. You too, Justin and Josh. Always great. Um, so when I was at TSL, I was a graduate student at MIT. I was in the comparative media studies uh, department, and my work was in primarily designing these simulations um, to elicit these mindsets. So what does that mean? Um, like Justin described, we design games and simulation for teachers to actually get a chance to practice doing their work better. So what I was trying to do was pretty much ground those designs and simulations in a framework for equity. Um, and so you'll see in this graphic, we have on the left, this beautiful green and gray um, framework uh, called the Educator Mindset uh, and Consequences Framework. And for each of those major dimensions that you see in that first column, demographics, culture, SES, we ended up designing a simulation on that last column um, to pretty much elicit where people were in that spectrum through a practice space or simulation. And we had four of those that we created called Roster Justice, Coach Right, Jeremy Journal, and Layers. Um, before I talk about those simulations, I wanna quickly overview what the mindsets are um, just so we can get an understanding of like, what are we even talking about here? So there's four mindsets of these five that we um, ended up focusing on. We couldn't do all five, um, but pretty much these come from Richard Milner and his colleagues. They identified five major tenets of educational practice that are essential to understanding opportunity gaps. So each of these mindsets, we say it reveals biases and perspectives around equity and, inclu and inclusion um, and the practices that go with those perspectives and then the consequences for students that goes with those practices. Um, and through those lenses, these mindsets can either support or prevent your students from uh, reaching their full potential. Um, so the first one is aware and avoidance. Um, these cover the extent that power balances across student demographics are integrated into instructional decisions, curricular decisions, policy level decisions. It also is concerned with the extent that people are comfortable explicitly naming demographics. Um, is it a taboo topic? Are we okay saying demographics like female, uh, black, white, um, low income? Can we explicitly name them? Um, and talk about how students who from these demographics are experiencing school differently from each other. Uh, the deficit asset framing mindset provides insight into the extent that teachers draw upon students' unique cultures, their backgrounds, uh, their personalities, their community assets, so that students are learning um, meaningfully. And it also includes ensuring high expectations um, for all students to thrive, no matter what. Uh, the third mindset here, equality and equity. 
Um, this set of mindsets addresses the way that educators consider the way larger um, issues in society, such as meritocracy and student family privilege influence uh, students' achievement and success. Um, whether students and teacher, whether teachers are actually providing students tailored support, depending on where they come from, or if they're giving students additional opportunities to succeed or not. Uh, the last mindset here that we're gonna talk about uh, is the social context one. It breaks into a contextual and sociocultural, and that one pretty much sheds insight into how much curriculum and school practices reflect an appreciation of what's going on in students' lives outside of school. So how much are we considering students' family and community lives in making sure they have a meaningful learning experience? And so that was a mouthful, but pretty much that doesn't matter so much, only that we designed these four simulations, Roster Justice, Cotri, and the other two to sort of bring out those mindsets in a simulation sort of style environment. So here is the overall look and feel for one of these simulations, Roster Justice. Um, what we did, I can explain these pictures, but the way the simulations go is we present data along the way and dialogue between yourself and students or admin that might be in the situation. Um, we designed them to be as neutral as possible so that um, it feels like it would feel in real life, right? So we don't want you to think there's a right or wrong answer. It's designed so that you're sort of given information that you usually would as an educator. Um, and we don't, we simply present the data and you decide what you wanna do as you go. So here's an example of three data points that we describe that we share in roster justice. Um, so it could mirror real life. And one of those where we show uh, in roster justice, this is the practice space that aligns with the aware avoidance mindset. Um, and pretty much what you're doing in this one is the educators are reviewing this data, um, including class rosters, their own schedules to determine pretty much um, whether the classes are distributed fairly, fairly by the student demographics, because that's pretty much what that mindset's about. And then they have a chance or not to advocate on behalf of these students to the principal who's responsible for these curricular decisions. So along the way, they're seeing these rosters. We ask them, do you see anything? Um, what do you see? Pretty open-ended. And so that allows us to sort of see, okay, what are you seeing? And then you can see in that last slide, um, the principal is saying, okay, well, we're seeing this and you decide okay, do I want to advocate? Do I want to defer? And along the way, you're given this data and moments to pretty much respond um, or not. And that's pretty much how they go. Uh, so we're gonna highlight one of those, uh, Jeremy's journal. And this was about the equity equality mindset, tailored support or everybody gets the same thing. Um, in this practice space, Jeremy's journal, you go through it with, um, uh, you follow a kid, Jeremy, for a week, pretty much Monday through Thursday. And every day, Monday through Thursday, you're given a snippet of Jeremy's journal. So if you look at that first image, you're seeing Monday. Um, this is what Jeremy turned in. And you're looking at what he turns in every single day of the week. And you're pretty much prompted at the end, based on what you see, what do you want to do? Do you want to talk to him alone? Do you want to talk to the whole class? Do you want to just move on? It's not that important. So along the way, you're sort of prompted, like, what do you want to do as you're seeing more and more data about what's going on with Jeremy? At the end of the simulation, we pretty much present you with like the game changing decision. Like this is the deal breaker that we're hoping will give us insight into how you're going to handle, uh, you know, the situation. And so what we do here is we show that there's a quiz on Thursday and you pretty much have to decide is Jeremy gonna take this quiz or not? He comes to you with a letter from his mother that says, you know, pretty much he's been in the doctor's office. Um, she couldn't get a, a letter from the doctor, but my kid is, this is what's been happening to my kid. Like, please excuse him. Jeremy comes to you on the last day and he's like, I have this letter. I don't have a doctor's note. I can't take this quiz. My mom will kill me. And so you have to pretty much take into consideration everything that you've seen Jeremy do over the week the decisions you made along the way to support him or not throughout the week. And then this final piece of information about this letter, okay? So there's a few things you want to keep in mind. Um, what he's done, you know, the validity of this letter, um, whether this letter aligns with school policies or not, you know, whenever there's a doctor's note. So you have all these pieces of data you have to keep in mind. And we find that depending on what people notice, whether it's 
the week long getting it or not, you know, at the end of the day, was he showing up? What was his social patterns? Depending on what people notice with all this various data we give them, people make their own decisions. And depending on what they wanna do, handling this letter along the way, that allows us to have insight into what is most important for how they're gonna move forward with Jeremy. Thanks, Josh. So this last slide I'm gonna cover is what we see. So we see that people do a number of things when we show them this, um, this letter. And these are examples of responses that Josh and I and Justin were able to elicit from some of our courses when, when actual real educators did this simulation. And we see that there's a range of things that people do, but we were actually able to categorize them between that equality side or that equity side from that graphic I showed you in the very beginning. When prompted, when shared that letter, educators have said a number of things. We've seen two examples of equality mindsets, um, which was everyone has the same chance, everyone gets the same thing. And these are the sorts of things that uh, educators say to Jeremy. They say, thanks, Jeremy. Please let your mom know that in the future, you will need a note from your doctor when absent, right? Focusing on the letter. Uh, they also say, thank you for bringing me the note. But as you know, the school policy is to bring a doctor's note. So you can be excused from class. Do you have that or not? Okay, so that's an example of everyone has the same chance. Everyone follows the policy. Where is your letter according to the policy? Um, on the opposite spectrum of that mindset, equity versus equality, we also see equity looking mindsets. And this is what people have said. They have said, thank you for the note, Jeremy. Are you feeling better today? I'm not going to give you all the work you missed, but would like to get, look back at your notes. The first lesson to see, um, would you like me to go over that with you? Another one is, I'm glad you're feeling better. Let's get you paired up with someone who can help you catch up. So in those two examples, they're very different. Um, but in those two examples, they're both considering Jeremy's lived realities, and they're also focused less on the note and more, what's going on in Jeremy's life? How can I support him? Even though everyone has this quiz today, and typically everyone needs a doctor's note, I want to work with him to see like what's really going on so I can make sure he succeeds. Versus sort of focusing in the first two, and we see equality mindsets, that they're more focused on the letter and the policy, and typically this is what needs to happen, so why didn't you do that, right? So those are the sorts of things that we see. Um, thanks, Elizabeth. But this is a great uh, transition to talking a little bit more specifically about the uh, research that, that we did. Um, so this study comes from um, data that we collected uh, in our online course, Becoming More Equitable Educator. Some of you um, participated in this course and some of you, um, you know, consented to agree, uh, participate in our research, uh, which we're really grateful for. Um, the course ran, it sort of started right as uh, everything was shutting down um, at, at the beginning of um, COVID-19. And then it ran kind of through the end of June, 2020. So um, during the Black Lives Matter uprisings. Um, and so it's sort of a really critical, in some ways a very critical time point um, in, in, in our history. Um, we just happened to have scheduled the course to run during that period. Uh, we've had uh, almost uh, 8,000 people uh, sign up for the course and about a thousand people uh, did at least one of our simulations. Um, and so the way that we were designed the research, we looked at the people who did at least one simulation and we took, um, and who consented to participate in the research, and we took um, all of their simulation responses. So every line of the responses in all of the simulations. Um, as you can see, it's, 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 a, it's a lot of data. It's almost uh, 40,000 rows of data. And so this is, this is a pretty large um, data set. Um, in terms of, of text data. And a lot of the existing research on simulations um, either kind of looks at very, very small like case studies of individual simulation activity, or they'll sort of do like a pre-post evaluation where they look at what do people think before they do the simulation, what do they think after they, they, they did the simulation. But there's very little research into what do people actually do in these simulations and to what extent are they actually applying their learning um, in simulation behavior. Um, and this is sort of a real important because, you know, people might, as Justin sort of alluded to earlier, people might say, oh, I believe this thing, or I'm, you know, really supportive of equity, but when I actually get presented with a scenario, how do they respond to that um, you sort of in, in, in real time? And so we um, wanted to sort of use this data to really understand how did people actually respond 
within the simulations um, themselves. Um, so, as I said, it was a very, very large um, corpus of, of, of data. And so, would it have been practical to analyze it sort of line by line? So, what we did is we used a uh, method uh, from natural language processing called uh, topic modeling. Um, so I won't go into all the technical details of, of how this works, but basically to summarize, um, what topic modeling does is it looks at patterns in words uh, within a text. And based on the patterns, it sort of pulls out sort of com uh, words and things that tend to co-occur together. Um, so for example, let's imagine that you were looking at two articles in the sports section of the newspaper. Um, and one of the articles was about baseball and one of the articles was about football. In the article of baseball, you might expect you know, certain words like pitcher, baseball, home run. These are words that are very specific to the context of baseball. So if you see those words or for computer saw so those words, you would know that this is an article about baseball. Versus if there was an uh, article about football, it might have things like yard, quarterback, touchdown. Those are words that are specific to football. And so the computer will be able to detect which are the um, articles that are about baseball and which of the articles are, 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 are about football. Um, one of the sort of good qualities about this type of approach is it doesn't require any a priori assumptions about the structure of the data. So we didn't have to before come in with a set of like, these are the specific um, things that we are looking for. Um, we sort of allow the computer to identify what are sort of the underlying patterns um, in the data. Additionally, the specific um, type of topic model that we use is called structural topic modeling. And this allows for the inclusion of predictors into the model. So it allowed us to see, are there any correlates to different topics appearing in simulation responses? And in particular, we were interested in how did people's beliefs about equity as, as they said on surveys, how is that related to their behavior within the simulations themselves? Um, so just to kind of give you a, a sense of, of how the topic model works, um, uh, these are two topics that were sort of pulled out of our um, out of our um, data. So topic seven, um, and and the lines represent how much is that word specifically associated with that topic. So the larger the line the more associated that particular word is with that topic. So for topic seven, the words that were most highly associated with topic seven were today, yesterday, better, feel, now. And for topic 10, it was doctor, absence, note, mom, get. And those are the words that were most associated with uh, topic 10 versus topic seven. Now, Imagine you had uh, this uh, set of texts from the example that Elizabeth talked about earlier. Um, imagine that you, the, you, you know, you're saying, we missed you at class yesterday, hope you're feeling well. Um, just sort of like looking at this data, uh, which topic do you think would be more associated with this piece of text? Topic seven or topic 10? Um, I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll just give you a minute to think about it. And then I will tell you what the computer said. So the right, so what the computer predicted was um, topic seven. It said that the most probable topic that was associated with this response was topic seven because it evaluated what words were most associated. Um, with that particular topic. And the topic modeling is also probabilistic. So it doesn't sort of assign an individual topic, it assigns a probability of how likely is each topic to appear within a particular response. And so we apply this topic model, we applied it across all of, of the simulations um, within the course. And for each simulation, it pulled out a different set of topics. We were able to see what are the topics that were associated um, in each, each people's response and what types of, of things did, did it detect. Um, and one of the, the surprising things was that even though we didn't assign any labels, uh, the topic model was able to detect um, uh, themes that you know, Elizabeth had actually sort of thought about putting in. So the same with the doctor's note, there's sort of two options of, you know, are you gonna mention um, the, you know, the fact that you don't have a doctor's note 
and that's the school policy, or you're going to ask Jeremy how he's feeling. Um, that was actually something that the that the model was able to detect from people's responses and, and so as distinct ways that people might respond in, in this simulation. Um, so then once we had the topics, we're then interested, okay, which topics are more or less associated um, with uh, the educator mindsets that we had talked about earlier? And we used a survey scale um, that we had developed uh, prior to the course that had a, 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 a set of survey items for each mindset. So for each mindset, there was a set of you know four to six survey items that were associated with each mindset. And then we looked at, okay, how correlated were people's responses with um, on the survey with the topics that appeared um, in, in their simulation responses. Um, and so this is, this is from, from the article. And so one of the things we found was that there was a pretty strong association between certain topics appearing in people's responses and um, people's survey responses about equity. So for example, in the Jeremy's Journal um, simulation, the, the, the doctor's known school policy was more associated with an equality perspective than an equity perspective. So people who sort of mentioned that the fact they didn't have a doctor's note were more likely to on survey responses indicate more of an equality perspective versus uh, people who said about Jeremy feeling better uh, or asking how he was feeling, those people were more likely to have an equity perspective. Um, and we noticed similar trends across other simulations that things that we had sort of intended of, um, you know, identifying potential, um, you know, less equitable or more equitable behavior in the simulations themselves were associated uh, with those uh, behaviors. Um, and so that was sort of an interesting find, sort of that the simulations are sort of measuring in some sense, like what are people actually, um, you know, behaving and can actually detect it um, using uh, natural language processing. Um, so then we weren't just interested in like, could we measure this? We actually were interested in additionally, can we actually look for changes in behavior over time? So part of the goal of the course was not just to uh, change, you know, people's professor attitudes, but actually change how, how they acted and how they thought about teaching. And so we wanted to see, do we actually see any changes of behavior within the simulations? Uh, but one of the challenges was that because each of the simulations were different, you couldn't make kind of direct topic comparisons between each simulation. You had to actually uh, look at differences across different types of simulations. Um, so what we did is we sort of took a, a, a norm group. So we took um, the people who had the top quartile of participants on the pre-survey as a reference group. And we, we said, okay, those people are gonna be sort of our reference, but we wanna see how did everyone else compare to this group in terms of the, the types of responses that they had in the simulation uh, itself. Um, and so we basically took everyone's uh, uh, sort of topic probabilities. And then we said, okay, what is the, the maximum probability that any of these particular topics would appear in, in your simulation responses? And then we said, okay, we have this sort of group of top quartile people. How, how similar or different are your responses to the average response of someone in, in that group? Um, so we're looking at if your responses are more similar, we're going to assume that that means that you're behaving more equitably uh, within the, the, the simulation itself. Um, so we use something called the Euclidean distance measure, which looks at how similar um, are is someone's uh, sort of a set of responses. And, and what we wanted to see was that people's responses, the distance from, from that group uh, decreased over time, indicating that they were acting more like the equitable group. Um, this is uh, not gonna go all the way into the math here, but this is sort of an illustration. Uh, imagine the like green dots are the top quartile group and the purple dot is, is a, a participant um, this uh, hypotenuse, if you remember from geography, this measures the distance of that person uh, from that group. So the closer they are um, to that group, the more similar uh, their responses are. Um, and so within the first simulation, we saw that people who had the lowest um, at equity attitudes on surveys were also the furthest away uh, from, from, from that top quartile group, that they had the largest distance. 
So basically what this represents is that on any given topic, they were at about a four percentage point difference in terms of how similar their, their, their responses were to that top group. And that sort of trend, as you got closer in terms of the survey, you also got closer um, in terms of, of your responses in the German journal. Um, but what was really exciting is that um, when we looked over time, so we looked at each simulation of the course, all of the, the quartiles got closer to that um, top quartile. All of them were shifting um, to have their responses be more similar, and they were also becoming more similar um, to one another. And so by the end of the course, you know, most groups were pretty similar in terms of, of how they responded um, on, 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 on the survey, uh, in, in the simulation. And we think that this indicates that people are sort of applying kind of what they're learning in the course. So before they, they started the course, you know, they had, they had very different approaches, but as they learned about some of the content in the course, they're starting to apply those uh, within, within the simulation itself. And this is starting to sort of merging behavioral that people are actually taking what they're learning and applying it um, in, in their own practice. Um, and this is the paper, I didn't include this in the slide, but you actually see corollary in terms of changes in um, mindsets and the surveys and also changes in self-reported uh, equity practices. Um, so just to summarize, um, so, you know, we really think that simulations are a useful tool for both teachers to practice learning, for measuring uh, learning, and also looking at changing over time. And that topic modeling can be useful for helping to automate some of this um, analysis. And that it was useful both in identifying what topics were associated with equity behavior, and also looking for um, uh, changes, uh, ch changes over time. Um, so now um, we have some time for questions. I don't know, Elizabeth, um, do you want to sort of look at the questions that are there? Or if you, uh, um, we're getting a little feedback. Thank you so much for that, Josh. We're getting a little feedback in the chat that the slides were delayed. So oh, okay. I can't see and they can't see your beautiful graph that you were just explaining okay. to the past. Okay. Is that, are you able to? We can't see it still. Now? Um, you, 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 you can't see any of, of the slides. No, nope. we're on the examining change over simulation slide. We haven't seen uh, the graphic uh, that you were just Oh, man. Okay. Uh, let me, let me uh, stop sharing and then I will reshare and hopefully that will work. We'll try to debug this thing. Um, are there any uh, questions that we could answer in the chat, Elizabeth? Yeah, so we saw some questions about the design. I see people got links, which is good. Um, people asked if the simulations can be used in professional development, and they are. That is pretty much the medium that we share them out in the world is actually mm -hmm. through professional development workshops. And before COVID, we went to a lot of schools. And like while we were still in the design process, um, we got a lot of feedback from students, from teachers, from principals, admin, family members about um, you know, what was going on in their schools, what were the most common situations that come up and that fed into our design, the personalities of the students, the decisions that teachers had to make and those sorts of things. So uh, I think, yes, this recording will be shared. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, and then I think that we were able to share those links of all, each of those simulations is public use and you can use them for anything or tweak them or in any way, um, but I'm hoping we can get this graph on here because Josh yeah. got it. <laughs> I know. I, I, I apologize. I can't it's even like a real graph. I'm gonna. I'm <laughs> gonna. I'm gonna exit out of the webinar and see if I can. I can get my like screen to refroze. I can't even figure out how to stop sharing. Do you want to just reboot and I'll stay? Yeah. I'm, 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 gonna, stay. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna reboot. Are, are you listed as a? You're listed as a host, right? So it we'll, yes. won't we'll close everyone out. Okay. I will. I will do that. And I see a research methods question, and we will talk about that next week for sure. Um, I can answer that question about the uh, research methods. Um, I think um, what um, I think what I I'm, I try to do um, in in my work is think about how can we take um, some of the sort of great um, 
research and insights that qualitative um, researchers have had looking at um, students' experiences in classrooms and thinking about how can we sort of extend that into uh, a broader uh, into a broader sphere and look at sort of how does this how does this work when we are looking at it in a large scale uh, learning environment and without sort of sacrificing some of the quality of people's actual uh, words and expressions and feelings. So in a lot of ways, this, this, this process sort of draws on, you know, a mixed methods approach, looking at not just, you know, numbers and what, what are people saying, but also what are people's actual words. Um, and it's been really um, illuminating and interesting to see what are just the different ways that if given a situation, people, people will respond to it. Um, and are hoping that, you know, as these simulations sort of become more prevalent, we can really learn more about, you know, how, how does, you know, your response to simulation, what does that say about your attitudes about teaching, about working in the classroom um, and other things? And how can we use simulations as a way to sort of nudge and prompt people toward rethinking some of their original assumptions about teaching? I um, also see a question um, from Sarah Fireman. Um, I'm curious about what you think you've learned from the research that we apply more broadly to educator or principal preparation programs. What are the next steps for you and what have you found to be the strengths of simulations and what ways you're seeking to improve them? I don't know, Elizabeth, do you want to talk a little bit about your work um, and how you, you've used this simulations? Sure, yeah. So um, thanks for the question, Sarah. So we use these simulations in a broad variety of PDs um, explicitly in the one roster justice that I was showing you in the beginning um, with the class roster um, and you were seeing the teacher schedule. And so that simulation is actually like, a, it's a conversation between an educator and a principal. And so the educator has gotten their curriculum, their, um, their schedule, their roster, and they're supposed to see like, what patterns am I, am I noticing here? Um, and the principal, and so pretty much you're dropped into a situation where you've requested a meeting with your principal and the principal's like, what, what is it? What's going on? Like, I'm here, what do you need from me? And then you're pretty much asked to describe like what you're seeing um, in your rosters, in your classes, in your scheduling, what you, what you and your colleagues are talking about. And so throughout that simulation, the principal is really pushing back. He's like, you know, I don't, you know giving a number of reasons as to why he can't do anything about it, essentially. Um, he's like our quintessential, like, we don't have time for this kind of guy. He's like, you know, we don't have the funding. We don't have the staffing. This is too, this is too close to the school year. So along the way, the principal is giving examples of reasons why there's nothing he could do to fix, you know, the imbalances that you're seeing in the schedule. Um, and so when people go through that, we've seen in PD, we've done it in small groups, really large groups. Um, when people go through that, at the end, we find that people have a variety of things. They said to the principal, some people will sort of just defer to the principal early on and won't, you know, you know, because there's that power imbalance, which is really replicated in real life, right? If you're a teacher, you're not going to always, you know, want to advocate for your students in front of and to your boss. So what we find is that people, you know, they, you know, teams of teachers are like, okay, is our principal like this? Is he not? Like, what sort of are the best ways to advocate for students when we're fighting, you know, we're coming up against these barriers that are concrete, that are real at schools, but also like, is he sort of just shifting the responsibility? So what we see is that the strengths of the simulations are that it puts everyone who's participating in them on the same page, because we all went through the same simulation. We all saw the same data and we were all asked, what are we gonna do? What differs is how people respond to it. And I think what we've seen is the conversations that teachers get to have with each other about how they responded or why, or what they noticed along the way or what they didn't, really helps them to develop, um, especially when we put the things they noticed and like what we recommend as best practices in the simulation into perspective to what they really did. And we give them that framework and we say, well, if you didn't advocate for the students and notice that these classes were super um, blocked off, right? So what you'll see in that simulation is that all the black kids and girls and students with disabilities are all grouped into one class. And then mostly white males and Asian males are put into this computer science class. And it's because of a number of things that are going on at the school. Um, but 
whether you notice them, whether you're able to communicate that to the principal, why would you, how would you do that? Those are the conversations that we see teachers have with each other um, after they finish the simulation. Um, and they learn a lot from each other. They learn about um, what's the best, you know, way to handle this that is gonna be most equitable for students. And what, if I had done this, is probably harming my students in the long run because it aligns with the less equitable mindset that is actually happening all the time. So um, we think those are the strengths, putting everybody on common ground, giving everybody a common language, um, giving everybody examples of what the right thing might be to do or how to improve. Um, and the way we seek to improve them, um, there's everything can always be improved. So um, I guess like we always take feedback. So the, the thing, another thing about the design process is that what you see has been iterated like 10 times. I mean, that's not even an under exaggeration. Um, the first time we do this, we test this out with teachers, with our colleagues, we test it out on each other. So by the time we actually share these simulations, they've been iterated. It's just an iterative design process. So we kind of like, once it's there, it's there because we've, we've improved it based off so much feedback um, to make them as like neutral seeming as possible so that the things that people actually do are like what they would actually do, not because they're being prompted to do it, because, but because it's what somebody would actually do. So I think that iteration always improves. Um, I have to think a little more on what the next step would be for them. But I think the simplicity is honestly like an affordance because I think the more simple the design is, um, the more space it gives people to pretty much do anything that they would do. I think the more complicated sometimes the design gets, you get less of a cohesion between, we're seeing a lot of patterns. The patterns become more hard to, um, to interpret and give people good advice based off of them. Yeah, I agree. I think definitely the sort of simple structure really helps a lot. Also gives everyone sort of a common frame of reference for like, okay, what did you do in this particular situation uh, in the simulations? Um, one other thing help, uh, that uh, I've been working on is thinking about ways that we can in the moment process people's responses. So, and, and, and give them feedback. So, you know, and thinking about when is the right time to do this and what size feedback. So for example, you know, if someone's doing the simulation and they've sort of like, based on their responses, it's pretty clear that they see Jeremy as sort of a like troublemaker. Like he's just sort of being deliberately, rather than some people might see him struggling in school and feeling embarrassed. Some people might think that something is happening at home. There are also some people who see the same set of facts and say like, oh, well, he's clearly just trying to test my authority as a teacher and he's goofing off and he just gets act together. Um, and so we see that in, in the people's responses. Is there a way to actually give people feedback in the moment? Like, okay, right, maybe take a step back and kind of look at some of the evidence um, that you've seen over the week. Um, and like, does, is that consistent with your interpretation? Um, I think similarly, sometimes people will say like, you know, very common responses is, is that, um, Elizabeth, you can, so if you've seen this, you know, I wanted to take the quiz because I want to see how he's doing, um, which is, you know, I think uh, teachers often want to get feedback about what their students know. However, there's been a lot of evidence through the week of how he's doing and what he knows. And so taking the quiz is not really going to add that much to, 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 to that evidence base. Um, and so part of what we're thinking about is are there ways that we can kind of give people feedback within the simulation itself and so they can kind of think about uh, their, their own responses. Um, I see one more question. Um, um, right, that's a different question. Um, is there any other um, questions in the chat or anything else people people wanted to share uh, before we conclude? Um, oh, I see somebody asked if it's possible to play these simulations. And, um, and there's sort of uh, two ways to, to access them. One is, is through the course itself. So um, the course is still free and available. So you can go out and take the simulations there. Um, the other option is uh, through the, the, the Teacher Moments uh, website. Um, oh, yeah, for Teacher Collaborations on Students Learn. Yes. Yeah, so you can, in the Teacher Moments website, actually 
um, administer the simulations yourself. You can you can collect data from your own students and look at how, what your students actually answered. Um, you can also create your own simulation. So it has an authoring tool that allows you to either modify or create uh, new simulations uh, in, in in teacher moments. Um, and we've been sort of adding, you know, new features all the time. Our, our colleague, uh, Garen Hilaire, is constantly sort of updating and, and adding new features and making it a better experience. So um, we have had um, over um, 600 scenarios authored and 13,000 people have participated um, um, in, in teacher moments. So I definitely recommend uh, taking, taking a look. Yeah. Uh, Elizabeth, do, do you have anything else to add? Uh, you're, you're on mute. That's all I have, but I'm happy to take any more questions that anyone might have. Great. Uh, and this uh, is also being recorded. Um, so we, we, we will um, uh, share the recording. And so if people aren't able to make it, uh, we, we, will, we will share the recording with them. So. Um, thank you again for joining. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be able to talk about this research with you. Um, and please uh, feel free to reach out with any questions in the future. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.